the other thing that we the other thing that we go ahead and, and study um, post-secondary after, after we go through um, different forms of schooling, complete high school, we study a lot of biology and chemistry courses. So it does require a bit more focused studying um, on the different systems of animals' bodies and how they, how they function. And then once we finish our college degree, there is another four years after that um, in veterinary school. That is focused very, very intensely on different species of animals in terms of how their body systems work. Um, and not everybody's created the same or equally. So I primarily get to work on dogs and cats, horses and cows, sheep and goats. But I also got to learn about snakes, you know, different, different types of birds, um, a lot of types of um, exotic species as well. I will say that's not something I'm familiar with as much, and that's the beautiful part of being a vet. You can kind of choose what you'd like to be part of. So, and as that transition um, through schooling, I, I did focus a lot of my time on volunteering in my community. I was active in different groups and community organizations um, and also throughout my years in college as well. It's really nice to be able to adapt and learn different skills and techniques of, you know, committing to um, different types of organizations to learn different communication styles, different requirements. And I think that helps in the long run once you become a veterinarian as well. So with that, um, I definitely invite anybody to share any questions throughout that process of what it took for me um, prior to becoming a veterinarian, um, what my studying was like, what my what my day to days were like. I was very committed um, to spending a lot of time studying and, and it it is a very intense process, but it's very rewarding as well. So with that, um, then it comes to my day-to-day. -day. I'm, I'm done, I graduated from vet school, and now I'm a veterinarian, right? So what does that mean? A day for me looks like arrival at the clinic around eight o'clock in the morning. I start to see appointments and, and learning about different types of um, animals um, are, are coming in for, whether that's routine wellness care, um, so they're coming in for their yearly shots, their medications, um, or I see sick animals too. When I get to see those animals that aren't feeling so well, um, and they don't have any, um, is they have issues outside of that, whether they're having belly upset, sore legs, bad eye issues, you name it. So I get to learn all different types of body systems and learn what's going on with them to try and find out you know what's wrong and and get them treated and get them fixed up. So, where I was planning to start is is to share with you what what it starts out with of doing a physical examination on a dog and what that looks like. I know that all of you lovely people got to see the image of my dog Luigi on my on my um, presentation slide, and now you'll get to see him in person. With me today, I have Sarah, who is my veterinary assistant, who is going to assist in showing you guys on um, how she is, how she plays a very, very critical role in my ability to do my job as well. So I will set that aside. Um, well, first, before I start my exam, I'll show you kind of around what it looks like um, here in our rooms. I'm in a physical exam room here. Luigi's playing with Sarah this morning. Um, and there's there's our exam tables um, that are that Luigi will be on, and he gets to be on a really nice soft rug. That's a scale to be able to get his accurate weight and tell us proper dosing of medications. And then I go ahead and start with my physical exam. So I will set this up for you guys to be able to, to see that. I do have an accurate weight on Luigi already, so I don't have to weigh him. That's a nice opportunity for cats, as cats are much smaller animals and, and don't need to have a, a large scale. So when I when I start looking at my, my patients, I look at them kind of from front to back. So I make sure their eyes are nice and straight um, and that they're able to, to see me by putting my hands in front of their eyes. 
then we go ahead, as long as they're nice, we get to look at their nice pearly white teeth and make sure they have, don't have to see the dentist um, and make sure there's no issues there. Luigi looks good today. Then I look in their ears. I go from their head to their toes, look in their ears. Everything looks great there. I'm feeling along their necks, feeling any type of lymph node enlargement, feeling how nice these legs are, that they can move back and forth appropriately. <laughs> and Luigi thinks that he uh, gets to have a, a lovely um, massage today. Then I move to their back, making sure everything is nice and even. I feel his little belly and make sure he doesn't have any painful spots or abnormalities in his belly. I feel for um, his pulse. So in a human, we get to feel for their pulse here. On a dog, it's on the inside of their back leg. We know that that's doing well. We feel their feel their knee joints and make sure everything's motion appropriate and they don't have any hip pain. And then I get to use this really cool text um, tool called a stethoscope. What this is going to do is allow me to listen to all the different compartments of Luigi's heart and make sure that it's good and strong and doesn't have any abnormalities that I know. The other opportunity it allows me to do is go ahead and, and listen to his lungs as well. I love my patients, so I'm okay with puppies giving me kisses. <laughs> um, and certainly it's nice when they're extra friendly. So when I listen to their heart, I put this um, stethoscope on the side of their body here on either side. So you gotta listen on both sides, just behind their front leg. And you can listen here. And then their lungs are in the area just around their rib cage as well. And then go ahead and I also listen on the other side as well. So there's two portions, two sides of the heart that we wanna make sure are functioning appropriately and also working well. The completion of my physical exam um, is, is partially also looking at, at the skin of the animal. Luigi has a fair amount of skin allergy issues. And so important areas that we look at for issues are behind their, in between their toes, under their feet, around their paw pads, um, in their areas of their armpits, essentially, and making sure we're not having a ton of issues there, their little bellies, and he's looking pretty good, um, which is really awesome. So that's the first part of the exam that we part, so we start out with on a dog and a cat alike, a horse and cow as well. It's just a little bit of a size difference with each patient from there. In addition to us being able to um, do their annual physical exam and making sure they're nice and healthy. We may also have to do a blood draw for annual blood work screening and going ahead and making sure all of their kidney and liver function is appropriate and that they're not having any issues there. And certainly we screen, we do annual testing and screening as well for any other um, diseases that are typically transmitted by wood ticks around here because we all know how how they are and, and we have to protect ourselves against them. And we also go ahead and protect dogs and cats alike as well. So as we finish blood work screening each, each year, we also go ahead and do yearly vaccines depending on where they're due for vaccines. With a vaccine that's, that's there to keep them healthy and protect their health so they aren't going ahead and, and getting exposed to diseases that can cause them some pretty intense sickness for these guys. And so our goal is to prevent that, prevent those diseases from happening as well. Different areas that you may have noticed in your own pets, if you've ever gone to the vet with your parents um, to give vaccines is, is just over their shoulders or over their rump are areas that we typically do vaccines for these guys. That, can sometimes cause them to be a little bit sore, but usually they're going ahead and, and feeling well within the first day after getting their, getting their shots. From there, um, we then go ahead and send home any medications that animals um, need for their year, whether that's any type of heartworm preventative or flea and tick preventative to prevent diseases from happening. Cause that's what our goal is to keep our patients he healthy we want to prevent those diseases. And we do that through annual vaccines, annual exams, and going ahead and putting them um, on preventatives. So
So that's part of our general routine wellness care um, portion. And I'm happy to take you guys um, throughout the clinic and kind of show you some areas um, of what we get to do. So, you know, I get to see a lot of lovely people in a physical exam room with their pets, but also there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. So that's whether we have a laboratory technician who is running all of the diagnostic samples for the blood work, any type of issues, if there were problems with the skin, we can look at that under the microscope and make sure that we're finding ways to make sure these guys are staying healthy. I also have a surgery suite in the back um, that I will show you um, where we would do surgery at in a place where there's no patients present. Um, and then also show you what our, what our, our veterinary x-ray and ultrasound look like as well. So then we get to take pictures of, of areas of their bodies that we can't see with our eyes. Um, so you may hear um, some people talking and some patients barking. We've got a lot of fun, exciting patients in the vet clinic today. So I will take you on a little tour and then we will end up back in the exam room and, and touch base from there as part of the wrapping up session. Also at our vet clinic, we do also have some cute clinic cats. Elsie says, good morning, everybody. I hope you guys are having a good day. Awesome. So as you can see, we have a microscope here at the clinic and we're able to go ahead and look at um, samples under the microscope that we can't see um, with, our, with our regular eyes and that allows us to magnify things that can be happening on animal skin, or on a lump that they may have. These are our machines for going ahead and testing any type of blood samples. These are our tubes where all of our samples are collected. This machine is going to test for any issues with kidney and liver function. And then this is going to read um, any red blood cells. As you can see, um, we have some samples rocking here as well. These tools here are called a centrifuge. They are going to spin really, really quickly and get our samples to the place that we need them and going to make sure that these, um, we have the abilities to assess the appropriate sample types from there. All right, now we are going to move to one of our surgery areas. Um, these are, I will show you this area here first is where we do most of our emergency care um, work in terms of our patients are dropped off during the early portions of the day for us to work into our busy schedule. We can do an evaluation and go ahead and make sure um, that they're healthy. Um, and if we have to do any non-sterile procedures like cleaning a dog's teeth, we can do that here as well. Yes, you did see a canister of peanut butter. That is one of our treats that we go ahead and delight our um, canine patients with to allow for them to have a happy and fear-free visit. This is our dental x-ray machine. So I can take x-rays of, of the dog and cat's teeth, just like we get when we go to the dentist every single year and go ahead and help us guide in determining whether or not we have to have any anything um, removed or if we can just clean our clean their patient's teeth. This next area is one of our sterile surgery suites. As you can see, um, our patients have a really nice warming blanket on the table and a towel underneath them to help cushion their, their um, time on our veterinary surgery tables. Behind it is a machine to, called an anesthesia machine that's going to allow us to um, keep them under anesthesia um, and provide fresh oxygen to them and keep them sleepy while they're having their procedures. We also do have a, an anesthesia monitoring machine here that's going to um, make sure we can watch the heart rate, their pulse, how fast they're breathing and watch their blood pressure, which is pretty cool. Just like when we go under anesthesia for any type of procedures. Um, aside from that, we do have airway tubes here that are used to go ahead and protect a patient's airway when they are under anesthesia. We do place IV catheters within them as well to allow them to be able to 
get um, IV fluids during their procedures and certainly um, keep their blood pressure um, normal as well. So it's a very fun process in the sense of getting a patient ready for surgery. Um, we usually have to shave their fur and scrub their um, skin very, very clean, clean um, to allow us to do perform their surgery in a sterile fashion. The next place I have you guys is, is um, in our x-ray room. So we have a nice x-ray, um, digital x-ray here that we can lay our patients in a certain positions um, and go ahead and capture the images and then we read them there on the computer. The last diagnostic tool I wanna share with you today is our ultrasound. It's dark now, um, but we use this little ultrasound probe and place this on areas of their body, of a dog or cat's body, to be able to tell what's, what's there, if there's an abnormality or if there's fluid present, or if we have to take and, and obtain any samples on a very guided, guided fashion. So it's essentially another way for us to see how to do our job safely for our patients from there. Awesome. So at that rate, um, typically we have our, our patients in, in different recovery stalls and areas for them to be monitored very closely and, and taken care of with one of our veterinary nurses after they have a procedure done on, on any day. We do surgery every day of the week. I typically have a single day of the week that I do surgery on, and, and that is typically on Tuesdays. So my Tuesday mornings are really, really busy. Um, and I'm usually working very closely to get my patients ready for their procedures, talking to their, to their owners and making sure any of their questions or concerns are answered from there. So. With that, that does complete my tour of the clinic. Um, I know that it's, I, I'm sorry, I don't really have a concept of time, but I'm, I'm happy to turn this over for questions if that's applicable, or if you any of you have any type of guidance you'd like me to speak upon. Thank you so much, Dr. Kusman. That was um, really exciting for all of us. I know I wanna be a vet now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, it's it's pretty fun. There's a lot of very rewarding things. And Luigi was such a such a good model patient for all oh, of us. Yeah. So we have a ton of questions that have been coming in and I have been trying hard to kind of put them in categories here so that okay. maybe, so that with the time that we have, maybe we can get to as many of them as possible. Some of I them are about that. you and some are about your patients. So I'm going to start with a question, a question that came in about you. How many years of schooling can you remind us did it take after you finished high school? How many more years of school was it before you could um, start your business? I went to school for eight years after I finished high school. Okay. Four, four, awesome. years, four years at my first college and then four years at my vet school college. Okay. And what was it that um, made you want to become a vet? What was your inspiration? Oh, gosh. Thank you for asking that question. Um, so what I actually had an experience with my colleague here. I, I was born and raised on a farm. And so we had a cow at one point having trouble having a baby. And they did, Dr. Dan here at the clinic did a, a C-section in the field or at, at our farm. And it was, it was really cool to be able to see that little baby calf be born alive and the cow continued to do very well and thrive as well. So that, that was definitely my inspiration. And that was the moment that said, I want to help animals and also help people because people come along with their pets and I love people. Yeah, awesome. And I think that's an important thing is that even in any job we do, we have to work with people and care about the people, even if that's the job right. isn't with with people. Um, yeah. Um, and another question that we this is an aside question will remind us of the clinic cat's name that we saw that fluffy cat. Oh, his name was Elfie. Elfie. OK, yes. there we have it. <laughs> um, great. Uh, so here are some questions we have um, about, do you make house calls as a question? So in the form of house calls, we don't, we don't go to the house for dogs and cats, but we do go to a farm and do treatments for horses and um, 
cows out at the farm. So we do we do drive to those locations, but our house calls are not. We don't do house calls. We we have animals come to the clinic. Okay, and here we have a question that just came in. How many dogs and cats do you typically work with in a day? So who come those that come into you? That's a really good question. Um, I would say on average between, you know, it's it's a mixture of each day of what I see. I will typically see, um, it can vary depending on my, on my duties, but to typically 10 to 15 um, patients a day. And that, that doesn't include patients that I may see after hours on an emergency basis. Cause I do, I, I am available for people after hours as well and on the weekends. Okay. And then there's some specific animal diseases that uh, we had questions oh. about. Have you had, um, how have you treated and have you worked with animals with pink eye? And there are questions on just general, like how you address dermatology issues with animals. And okay. another question was, um, do you do ultrasounds on pregnant animals? Oh, cool. Have you attended Absolutely. to birth? There's so many yes. good questions here. Oh, this <laughs> makes me happy. So pink eye doesn't happen in, in dogs and cats, which is really nice, not like in humans, but I, I have treated patients with eye injuries, um, scratches on their eyes, and then either injuries to their eyelids or the, the soft tissues around or underneath their eyelids as well, which is pretty cool. And um, um, there's a question, do, do animals use the same medications as humans? That's a fantastic question as well. A lot of them are very, very similar. Yes, absolutely. So medicines that um, we can take are very similar to what dogs and cats can take, but there are some dogs and cats can take that we can't take. And I think that's why you were saying it's important to weigh your animals also, right? Yes, so you know absolutely. how much to give them. Yep, very much so. So we're safe and making sure that we're keeping them treated appropriately and not giving them too little or too much. Okay, we now are the all the other animals um, that you didn't mention. You mentioned you work with cats and dogs and horses and cows. Yes. And a Correct. lot of other questions have come in with okay. uh, you can just say yes or no because there's so many of these. Okay. Um, fish. No. Eagle. No. <laughs> Elk. No, that would be very Moose. fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Moose. A bird. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you say bird? Moose. Moose. Oh, no. Nope. No. Okay. Hedgehog. Yes. Skunk. Nope. And now what is the smallest animal you've worked on and the biggest animal you've worked on? Oh, my goodness. The <laughs> smallest the smallest animal I have worked on primarily is like um, typically a very young puppy. Um, that I, I do C-sections on puppies just like or on dogs, just like I do C-sections on humans or some people are born that way. So I definitely the the fresh born little puppies and kitties that I have done C-sections for. Oh, sweet. Yes. Um, let me see. There's a question here. Why is chocolate toxic for dogs? Oh, that's a good question because of how their body um, breaks it down and in their how their liver um, filters things out, it causes issues with toxicity to their liver and their red blood cells. So okay. there are some differences. We don't have the same, we have the similar aspect of how things work, but there are differences. Oh, here is a, a good question from third and fourth graders on Washington Island. What is your favorite part about being a vet? Oh, I love that. The people, absolutely, the people in making pets better, for sure. So I I became a vet because I like to work with, with animals, obviously, um, but I have a really immense um, amount of gratification that I can provide comfort to patients and um, also to their owners during t great times and also difficult times as well. So I, I love it in the comprehensive aspect of being able to, to provide that that comfort and care to both the animal and to their owners. And I know we are over time because we got started late here. So I'm going to ask maybe three more questions. Does that okay. sound good, Mary? Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's a lot more questions on here, <laughs> than, yes. uh, but hopefully we can, we can um, get a theme here. Um, a question, uh, what is a typical vet salary? 
That's a really good question. I, a lot of that ma matters on where you're located um, in terms of rural areas like here in northern Wisconsin, or if you live in a, an area like Minneapolis or Madison, it'll vary. Um, but typically, when we think about it, um, there is a, a difference from about $75,000 a year to up to $100,000 a year. So it, it can be it can be pretty um, rewarding um, financially, but it's also a lot of work. So that's, that's right. True. Yeah, it's not it's not a job where you wake up and you know exactly where it's going to end because you have an animal giving birth. I'm imagining yeah. or there's an emergency. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, I had a question. Oh, there was a question of what do you do or have you worked with or what do you do if you have an animal that's out of control? that's out of control. Yeah. So what I will do, I will do is, is work with the, with the client in those situations, as well as with the pet and provide them treats and find them a very, you know, comforting place of giving them treats, allowing them to have a safe place to establish their boundaries um, in a more fear-free and a minimal restraint method. And if necessary, we can have multiple happy visits before we start to have to do anything or if, if it does come to it, we, we can sedate them safely and make them sleepy to get our, get our tasks done. That's fantastic. Um, I have uh, a, a, the second to last question. Well, this is the last question. Then I have a, a treat, a statement to read to you. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the hardest part of your schooling? The hardest part of the schooling is, is the amount of course load. So in vet school, I would, is, is the hardest portion. Um, and that takes, there are a lot of classes. There's a lot of information and a lot of very intricate details that we're learning about different types of animals, you know, whether, whether that's any species, um, and that can get a bit overwhelming, um, just simply on the amount of information that you, that you learn. And finally, we have a in the chat, there's a comment here from um, a teacher's last name, I think is Pinner. It says, thank you, Dr. Fay. I loved having you as a student in my eighth grade class in Mellon. Yep. That yep. teacher must be so proud to see you grown yeah, up really. and working and talking to their, their students right now. So thank you yes. so, so much for your You're time. Welcome. We loved having you join us today. Gosh, this was awesome. I'm so happy that I was able to reach and, and reach to so many students. And thank you for taking your time to, to learn about my lovely profession. Thank you so much. You're we'll, welcome. We'll see you around. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Faye.